Yeah, thanks a lot, Rebecca. So yeah, first of all, I, I think I should uh, like to thank the organizers, uh, Yael and Tara, for organizing such a wonderful conference. Yeah, it's, it must have been a lot of work, but it's also very rewarding to see so many people coming from sometimes far away and yeah, to see so many old friends again. In particular, of course, I'm happy to see two old friends, Rhea and, and Eugene. Uh, we actually go back quite a long time. Uh, I can pinpoint it exactly. Uh, we've met first on June 11th, 1990. Oh, wow. <laughs> at the birthday conference. I believe it was a birthday conference for Surio. So, so back then I was kind of beginning students Aix-en-Provence. Mm? Yeah, very nice memory. Mm? Right. Yeah, so apologies to those of you who've heard uh, this talk before. Maybe there's some uh, new aspects to the talk, some things we've um, polished a little bit. The progress has progressed a bit more slowly than hoped, but at least the first preprint is now out. And the second one we are working on. Hopefully that's going to be a bit faster this time. To get going, uh, so, so we're going to talk about Hamiltonian Verrazoro spaces. And so, first of all, some motivation of uh, where all this comes from. So some time ago, Anton asked me to look at these papers by physicists on JT gravity. Uh, work of Saad, Schenker, Stanford, Stanford, Witten, and some other papers. So JT stands for Jakif Teitelboim. And yeah, looking at those papers, to be honest, I, I didn't really understand anything at all. Um, but they have some nice pictures there, and you get a bit of, of the message of what they're doing. So somehow they're looking at moduli spaces of uh, surfaces, of Riemann surfaces, but with boundary. So the, the, because there's a boundary and, and they're supposed to have a hyperbolic metric, uh, these surfaces develop, uh, they call them trumpet ends, and mathematics are often called funnels. And then they do some, doing some geometry with those, those kind of surfaces with, ton, uh, with trumpet ends. Um, but there's a problem because they're carrying out integrals over those surfaces, and because of those trumpet ends, they have infinite volume. So those integrals typically don't converge. And so, okay, if they're physicists, they say no problem. We just cut off the boundary with some, we, we introduce this kind of wiggly boundary to cut off the infinity. And then the integrals converge. But then of course it depends on how you cut it off. And they say no problem. We just do a path integral of all boundary wiggles. And at that stage, you, you might think as a mathematician, maybe this is all just complete nonsense and it doesn't make any sense, but then you look further and they're getting a lot of mileage out of it. It's a Schwarzian derivative appears in, in their papers. Of course, the Virasoro algebra pops up, some decimal Heckman measures they're talking about. They're getting Mirzakani recursion formulas for moduli spaces. So there must be something to it. And, and you would expect, of course, with those famous names, Stanford and Witten and so on, uh, there has to be something to it. So we try to understand this a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and one understanding we have is, we believe what's really going on here is that one is dealing with some sort of infinite dimensional Teichmüller space. Uh, So-called conformally compact hyperbolic matrix on the surface. For this audience, maybe um, hyperbolic zero matrix is a better name. So you have a surface with boundary, and then there's a zero tangent bundle whose sections are the vector fields vanishing at the boundary. And then it's hyperbolic matrix on that zero tangent bundle, up to diffeomorphisms uh, fixing the boundary. So some kind of infinite dimensional Teichmüller space. And this infinite dimensional Teichmüller space should be a Hamiltonian Verrazoro space, yeah, whose, whose mode map takes various in the dual of the Verrazoro algebra. So that's one motivation. I, I'm going to define what Verrazoro algebra is in this moment. So we also expect that the more general uh, space of this uh, type will allow for some singularities in the hyperbolic metric. But that's still under development. So, so another motivation comes from uh, work that Chris and I did many years ago on Hamiltonian loop group spaces. So 
setting is that you have a connected Lie group with an invariant metric on its Lie algebra. And then we look at Hamiltonian loop group spaces, so infinite dimensional manifolds with a symplectic form and an equivariant mode map taking values in the dual of the Lie algebra of the loop group. Or more precisely, you're looking at the central extension of the loop group and it takes values in the affine hyperplane at level one. So it's not equivariant. Um, if, you, if you don't centrally extend, it's only affine equivariant. And otherwise, just satisfies the usual mode map condition. And yeah, equivariance, as I said here, is relative to the gauge action, where you think of um, the dual of the Lie algebra loop group as, as connections on a circle, if you want. Mm -hmm. So, a typical example for this is again for surface with boundary. You look at uh, flat connections on the surface with boundary up to gauge transformations, which are trivial along the boundary. And then, mode map is then just pulling back a, such a connection to the boundary. That's just what it is. Now, in 98, um, in this work with uh, Anton Alexeyev and Anton Malkin, uh, we found that uh, the Hamiltonian loop group spaces, if they have a proper moment map, they can be def uh, described in finite dimensional terms. There's a correspondence with what we called quasi-Hamiltonian G spaces, finite dimensional quasi-Hamiltonian G spaces. And yeah, this, this correspondence had many uh, applications. So first of all, one was able to give new examples of Hamilton loop group spaces. Um, there's some dust about Heckman theory um, that we could develop. Um, here, of, of, I mean, dust about Heckman measures, of course, have to do with uh, taking the Liouville volume form and pushing forward under the mode map. But if it's in infinite dimensions, you have a problem. So translating things into finite dimensions helps. And we were able to develop a good decimal Heckman theory and do intersection pairings again, because you're now in finite dimensions. Uh, eventually, one could work out a quantization of, of such spaces. So rigorously defined quantization because you're avoiding infinite dimensions and some other things. So basically, what we want to do now is getting something similar for Vera Zorro. So in this preprint that we just posted, we are obtaining a, a correspondence between certain Hamiltonian Verazoro spaces and certain quasi Hamiltonian spaces for the group PSL2R. And so we're hoping, and that's all still under development, that you get similar applications. So, new examples of Hamiltonian Verazoro spaces, for one thing. Uh, there should be some Dustman Heckman theory. So, the things that's been developed by physicists, hopefully, we can make more rigorous sense of maybe intersection pairings, who knows? Quantization, yeah, we really don't know if, if that's gonna work. Because of, of course, here we're dealing with the group PSL2R, which is finite dimensional, so that's good, but it's still non-compact, so we still have some problems. But it's a very simple non-compact group, so maybe one can do things, but we haven't done them yet. All right. So I should explain what is the Vera Zori Lie algebra. And I'm gonna, um, I mean, there are two ways of introducing Vera Zori Lie algebra. One is to just def, uh, write down the code cycle that defines it and uh, let that be it. But I prefer a coordinate free definition of Vera Zori Lie algebra. So Vera Zori Lie algebra informally is the uh, central extension of vector fields on a circle, but I'm working with an abstract circle, not with the preferred coordinate. And the principle we're using to define the central extension is, is the following, which of course you all know, but I'm, I'm going to say it very explicitly, that whenever you have a Lie group K with an action on an affine vector space, whose underlying linear space is the dual of the Lie algebra, and the underlying linear action is just the coagent action. So whenever you're in this setting, then you get a central extension of the Lie algebra in such a way that this affine space becomes the affine hyperplane at level one. I, I guess everybody knows this principle in some form, but I just wanted to say this very explicitly. So what you do uh, concretely is uh, this k hat, you can define as the affine linear functionals on this affine space. And then the bracket, uh, well, there, there's a natural map from affine linear functionals to linear functionals. So this gives the map from 
k hat to linear functionals on k dual, which is again k. And then the bracket can be written down like that. So x hat and y hat are fn linear functionals, x and y are the corresponding linear functionals. And this is the formula. So very simple. So one example is uh, center extent of the loop group. Let me recall how that goes. But again, I'm going to do things, going to do things over an abstract circle. So assume we have a connected Lie group with an invariant metric on its Lie algebra. Uh, by, by this metric, I mean um, non-degenerate, not necessarily positive definite. Um, we have a principal G bundle over an oriented circle, C. So you could think of C as C1, but again, I'm not using a preferred coordinate. Then we have the gauge group, which if, if it's a standard circle, the gauge group would be the loop group. Uh, it's Lie algebra are the sections of the edge line bundle. So functions, if you want, with values in the edge line bundle. The dual space would be one forms with values in the edge line bundle. So here I'm using the pairing which comes from the metric on the Lie algebra together with integration over C. Right, but, but uh, yes, so, well, this, sorry, this is the dual space, but the space of connections on the principal bundle is an affine space over that dual space. So this A of P is my E and it's an affine space over this dual space. Yeah, and then we have the gauge action on connections whose underlying li linear action is exactly the coercion action. So we're exactly in that setting. And so you get a central extension. So that's the standard construction of the central extension of the loop algebra. I, I don't need the central extension of, on the group level in, in my talk, so Lie algebra is good enough. Right. So Biazoro Lie algebra you can define in the same way. As I said, it's central extension of vector fields on a circle. And the affine space one uses here is the space of Hill operators. So I have to explain what is the space of Hill operators. Okay, to explain that, uh, we, we need some notation. Uh, I'm going to denote by absolute value of omega spaces of densities. So absolute value omega r is the space of r densities on this uh, abstract circle. So for example, zero densities are just functions. One densities are just one forms because I have an orientation on my circles, densities and one forms are identified. Minus one densities are vector fields, right, because they're sections of Tc as opposed to T star C. And yeah, another thing we need is, is that uh, the dual space of R densities would be one minus R densities, uh, because the pairing is just to multiply an R density and one minus R density together, you get a one density and you integrate over the circle. In particular, um, if you take the dual space to vector fields, I mean, this is the smooth dual, of course, I'm not working with distributions. The smooth dual to vector fields would be two densities, also known as quadratic differentials. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for some affine space whose underlying linear space is quadratic differentials. That, that's what I need. And this is going to be the space of Hill operators. And here's the definition. Okay, it's a bit shocking at first because you're using these strange uh, degrees of densities. It's a, a differential operator which goes from minus one half densities to three half densities with the property that it's self adjoint and its principal symbol is equal to one. But then if you think about this definition a little bit, uh, it starts making sense why you have to put these particular degrees. So first of all, for the operator be, to be self adjoint, L and L star have to act between the same spaces. And so that, that gives one condition on, on the exponents. And the symbol of a differential operator, I mean, in general, it's somehow a, a section of symmetric algebra of a dual algebra. So, so it, it's, it's some section of some density uh, bundle of some order. And if you want that order to be zero, so the symbol is actually a function that forces the degrees to be exactly that. So that's where it comes from. So that's the Hilbert operator, and that's the, the space we, we need. So this space of Hill operators 
is indeed an affine space over quadratic differentials. So if you have such a Hill operator and you add multiplication by quadratic differential to it, it's again a Hill operator. That's the affine space. And diffeomorphisms of the circle act on this space, and that's an affine action. And the underlying linear action is the coagent action, so we are in business, and you get a central extension, which is the virasoro Lie algebra. So that's the coordinate free of defining it. All right, so this is the coordinate free way, um, but you can, of course, then also spell it out what it means in coordinates, and that's when it starts looking impressive. So if you're in coordinates, then all these density bundles are trivialized. And this space of Hill operators has, has some base point. And so everything is described in terms of a co-cycle and the co-cycle you can calculate is exactly the gelfand fuchs co-cycle. Space of Hill operators, as I said, it has a base point which is taking second derivative. And the general Hill operator is obtained by adding a Laplacian, so to speak. In this context, it's, it's called Hill potential. So it's, it's basically just a Schrödinger operator if you want except that that's on a circle and things are acting on certain kinds of densities. The action of diffeomorphisms is some affine action uh, whose linear part is pushed forward. So here F lower star is really pushed forward as a quadratic differential. So that here I have to insist I treat it as a quadratic differential to get the formula right. And then there's some affine term, which is the famous Schwarzian derivative. So all these formulas you can just calculate. So you don't have to put them in in advance. It comes out from the calculation. All right. Everything clear so far? So now I want to talk about classification of orbits. So I, I want to develop the Verozoro story sort of parallel to the loop group story. So like, let's first recall a classification of coach and orbits of the loop group. But in this more, slightly more general setting that uh, I'm looking at a principal bundle over, a certain, over an abstract circle, not necessarily the trivial principal bundle. Okay, so it's a, a well-known fact that uh, the gauge orbits in this um, dual of the Lie algebra at level one. So to remind you again, this is the space of connections. So the gauge orbits in the space of connections, they're just classified by conjugate classes in the group. And the way the classification goes is you just take the monotomy of a connection around the circle. And you can say it in a bit more detail, how this goes. Um, so to say this in a bit more detail, making it a bit more complicated, we are pulling back our principal bundle to the universal cover of the circle. And then we're looking at sections of the pullback bundle, which are quasi-periodic. So this kappa I didn't define, kappa is kind of um, the deck transformation of, of C tilde. So if you go once around the circle, uh, this section picks up a monotomy, this, this H. So quasi-periodic sections. You should think of them as sort of the, the parallel transports for a given connection after you lift up to the universal cover. And then you get a diagram like this. So as I said, uh, these SFPs are like parallel transports for connections. So given this quasi-periodic path, you can also say it's, it's like a trivialization, right? Uh, given such a, a quasi-periodic section, you, you get the corresponding connection back. And so this is the quotient map on, on, on the left leg. It's quotient by G. And on the other hand, uh, the gauge group acts on this space of quasi-periodic sections, and the quotient map is taking the monotropy. So you have this correspondence diagram. So you have some space, uh, quotient by G gives the space of connections, quotient by the gauge group gives the group G, and then, of course, you have a residual action of the gauge group on, on this space, and you have a residual G action on that space, and so the spaces of orbits have to be the same. Right? So, so that, that's how you can explain it. But actually, there, there's even a little bit more to it than uh, just this correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence of orbits. Um, actually, you have some 
Morita equivalence of the actions. So not, not only are the orbits in one-to-one -one correspondence, also the stabilizers are isomorphic. And uh, kind of the transverse directions to the stabilizers are the same. That's the Morita equivalence of actions. Or another way of saying it is uh, you get a Morita equivalence of the corresponding action groupoids. So this picture we have. So on the right-hand side, we have the action groupoid for the conjugation action. On the left side, we have the action groupoid for the gauge action. And those two action groupoids are Morita equivalent. That's, that's where all, everything comes from. All right, same story for Vera Zorro. So for the Vera Zorro Lie algebra, the, there's a well-known classification of cohesion orbits. Uh, the version I need is, is due to Goldman and Siegel. There, there are many other versions um, due to other authors, um, but, but this, this is the version I, I need, which says that, uh, yeah, again, uh, it, it's, the cohesion orbits are classified by conjugacy classes, but it's conjugacy classes in the universal cover of PSL2R or universal cover of SL2R. Actually, not, not all of the conjugacy classes, only roughly half of them. That, that's what the subscript, uh, subscript plus stands for. It's a certain open subset. So uh, I first want to explain what is this open subset. So let me first draw a picture of the new universal cover of SL2R. So uh, universal cover of SL2R geometrically is the interior of a cylinder. Uh, open disk times R. And here's the set of conjugacy classes. I'm not quite sure if you can see the colors. Um, the, the red conjugacy classes here are the hyperbolic ones. The green ones are the elliptic ones. The blue ones are uh, parabolic classes. And yeah, the, these intersection points say they shouldn't really be blue. Maybe I should have drawn them black. Th this is the center. All right, so that's a picture, but uh, I mean, here I've drawn the conjugate classes uh, as submanifolds. So we should look at the space of conjugate classes. If a quotient by conjugation, I get this picture. So in this picture, the horizontal line is the elliptic conjugacy classes. The vertical lines are the hyperbolic conjugacy classes. The dots are the parabolic ones. And yeah, the, these uh, branch points, uh, that's the center. So that's a well-known picture of, of the conjugacy classes in the universal cover of SL2R. And this uh, subset basically is just exactly half of it, with the ones at zero included, the unit element excluded. That's exactly what one gets. So the classification of, of cohesion orbits of Virasol algebra is exactly given by this picture. That's what I'm saying. Okay, and again, this classification uh, can be explained in terms of a diagram, just like we had for, for the gauge group. So this time, this D of C is the space of developing maps. The way this goes is, well, same notation as before, we uh, take the universal cover of the circle, C tilde, as you know by kappa, the generator of, of the deck transformations. And this DFC is the space of developing maps. So a developing map, this comes from projective ge uh, geometry, is a local diffeomorphism, orient orientation preserving local diffeomorphism from this universal cover, C tilde, into RP1, into the projective line, which is quasi-periodic. So if I, if I uh, move by a DEX transformation, it picks up a monotomy. So the group PSL2R acts on RP1, and that's the monotomy one, one picks up. So this D of C is the space of such developing maps. So that's, that's the thing one puts at the top. But, but of course, one needs to understand what, is, what are these maps P and Q. Right, uh, this uh, dual of Vera Zora algebra is the space of Hill operators. How, what does that have to do with uh, developing maps? Okay, so let's, let's explain the left map. So 
the way that goes is that whenever you have a hill operator, you can look at a, a ODE theory, you can look at a fundamental system of solutions. U1, U2. Uh, you can normalize the run skin to be negative one, basically to get some orientation. And then you look at the ratio. That's, that's going to be then a map into RP1. So every fundamental system gives, set, gives rise to such a developing map, a map into RP1. And this you can revert. So conversely, every uh, developing map determines a hill operator. This, this goes back and forth. So there, there's uh, another uh, interpretation of hill operators in terms of projective structures on a circle. And this is basically what's, what's hidden here. So this is the quotient map P, but it turns out it's also the quotient map just for the next natural PSL2R action on the space of developing maps. So developing map is a map into RP1. You can act by PSL2R on, on such a map, and it's just a quotient map for that map. Very good. So that's, that's the left map. For the right map, um, well, the map, the developing map uh, goes into RP1. We can lift it to a map which goes into the universal cover of RP1 which is R. And then the, uh, the uh, quasi-periodicity under the action of PSL2R becomes a quasi-periodicity under, under the universal cover of PSL2R. And this Q of gamma is this kind of lifted monotony. So it, it does not depend on, on which choice of lift phi you, you choose. Phi is determined up to pi, but the lifted monotony does not depend on it. So that defines the right map. But then it turns out it's also the, uh, the quotient map for the action, natural action of diffeomorphisms on the space of developing maps. And so it's almost this, it's the same picture like what we had before, this, this kind of correspondence diagram. So this is now, now the diagram that we have, similar to what we had for the gauge group. And it proves this Goldman-Siegel result that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between orbits. Yeah, but this time there's a little subtlety. I mean, it's already a little bit more complicated than what we had before, but there's another uh, complication uh, coming in, which is that this is not quite a Morita equivalence of actions. So this, t this time it turns out that the stabilizers are not quite the same. And this gave us a bit of a headache. And in, in fact, this uh, right quotient map, the reason for, for the problems is that this right quotient map is actually not a principal bundle, it has stabilizers. Sometimes the stabilizers are integers, sometimes the stabilizers are trivial. And so this, this is a situation which we had to sort of figure out and understand. But then eventually we did understand it and it turned out, um, nevertheless, uh, we do get a Morita equivalence of groupoids. It's just uh, one of those groupoids is not quite an action groupoid. So on the right, we have, as, as before, an action groupoid for the action of PSL2R on this universal cover of SL2R. On the left, uh, well, we get a quotient of an action groupoid. Basically, what we're doing is we, we take the action groupoid and just quotient out by these discrete stabilizers that we get. And somewhat surprisingly, at first sight maybe, even though the stabilizers jump, the quotient is still uh, nice. It's, it's still a manifold, infinite dimensional manifold. All right. So that's all I want to say so far about orbits. Yeah, yeah. So, so he, uh, I've sneaked in infinite dimensional manifolds quite a while ago, and I'm not saying explicitly what kind of infinite dimensional manifolds I'm dealing with. No, no, G2 is finite dimensional. No, that's exactly the point that, that we are uh, relating something infinite dimensional with something finite dimensional in order to make it simpler. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> I, I once heard Anton give this answer. I refuse to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, certainly not, not, not Barnach. Um, so, so probably you would work with fresh A manifolds or with diffeologies. But uh, for the time being, we uh, kind of refuse to answer the question because our point is sort of to translate everything into finite dimensions 
So why should we bother so much working out all the details for the infinite dimensions? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is basically um, ah, backwards. Basically, whenever you have some some Rita equivalence like like this, once you have the uh, thing on the top, you can actually construct the group points on the sides. So we can just start off from D of C and construct it that way. So that's another description. So from from this other description, it's it's kind of clearer why why it has to be smooth. Um, and maybe I can also, uh, as a comment, what, what basically goes on, there's a toy example which I like to give, which sort of explains what's going on. Uh, if you take um, R2, uh, think of it as the symplectic group point of the real line with the zero Poisson structure. And now we, we're taking, uh, so let's say with, with coordinates x and y. And then you take R2, so again, I think of this as a group point. In this case, source and target are, are the same. And now we uh, look at the quotient of R2 by an equivalence relation where we say x, y uh, gets identified with x, y plus one over x. Then this quotient is still smooth. So the way it looks like is uh, b before we, we had a bunch of lines lined up. Now what we're getting is, uh, so this is of course only for x non-zero. Now we get getting a bunch of circles, but the radii of these circle go to infinity as it approaches zero. And then at zero, we have a real line. So there's some space like this. And it's, it's smooth. And the symplectic structure even descends to it. So it's another symplectic group point which integrates the zero Poisson structure. And if you think about it too, you can in this way classify, it's a nice exercise, classify all the symplectic group points integrating the zero Poisson structure. So the, the, this, this picture is basically exactly what, what we have here with our Virasoro. So, so we, we again have these discrete stabilizers which are typically integers, but the way uh, uh, they change is, is exactly like in this, is, for example. Okay, now, now I want to throw in some geometry, some Poisson geometry. Uh, so first of all, going back to this example with the principal bundles. So already in this, this earlier paper on group valued mode maps, but more explicitly in this somewhat later paper, we discovered that on the space uh, of quasi periodic sections, uh, there's an interesting two form which is, um, as I said, has really nice properties. It's invariant under all the symmetries that one has. So this gauge action is even invariant under all automorphisms of, of, of the principal bundle and also under the G action. And well, it's differential is the pullback of the three form on the group. So eta is this Cartan three form. Uh, the contractions with generating vector fields for the G action are very explicit. And the contractions with the generating vector fields for the gauge action are also very explicit. So basically uh, what one has here is like the right-hand side in the mode map condition for quasi hamiltonian spaces and the right-hand side in the mode map condition for loop group spaces. So there's this interesting two form in the picture. And uh, yeah, better way of, of thinking about it is, is that actually we don't just have a meter equivalence of group points, we have a, a meter equivalence of quasi symplectic group points. So on this um, conjugation group point, th there's some uh, two form which makes it into a quasi Hamiltonian space. And on this other group point, there's a two form. Well, this is basically like a cotangent bundle. And yeah, so roughly this is like a dual Lie algebra of, of, of a Lie group, and then this is the cotangent bundle, and there, there's a symplectic form on it. And our two form gives a Morita equivalence between these two group points. And this is the reason why there's a correspondence between the corresponding Hamiltonian spaces. That's, that's why we can translate between Hamiltonian loop group spaces and quasi Hamiltonian spaces.
for example, one gets the correspondence between gauge orbits and conjugacy classes. But, but what I mean here is you don't just get the correspondence between orbits as such. Uh, you also incorporate um, that the quotient orbits have symplectic structures, and the conjugacy classes have these um, two forms also. So we'll be getting the same correspondence, but with some geometry attached to it. Yeah, and the same thing goes on for uh, this uh, Verazoro story. So we discovered there's a canonical uh, invariant two form on the space of developing maps with similar properties. So it's differential, it's the pullback of the three form. The contractions with the generating vector fields for the G action are understood and basically like the right-hand side for mode maps of group value mode maps. And uh, contractions with generating vector fields for diffeomorphisms, uh, well, the right-hand side for which should be Hamiltonian Verrazzaro spaces. So as a result, we get for one thing, again, Umrita equivalence between uh, quasi-symplectic groupoids, except again, uh, one of those groupoids is not quite an action groupoid. It's a quotient of an action groupoid. Yeah, but, but it, it takes into account the, the symplectic structures. So just like we had in this toy example, uh, this space here is like a cotangent bundle. It has a natural symplectic form, and we find that the symplectic form descends to the quotient. And so we, again, get a symplectic groupoid. Right, and so, so from, from this, we get the correspondence between Hamiltonian Verrazzaro spaces and certain quasi Hamiltonian PSL2R spaces. Um, yes, yes, so, so, so that, that, that's how it, how it goes. I mean, in, in, in general, for these um, uh, quasi symplectic group points, uh, the thing on the, on the top is a quasi Hamiltonian space. The thing on the uh, at the bottom has a Dirac structure. So so he, here one has a Poisson structure which gets integrated to a symplectic group point. Here one has a Dirac structure integrated to a quasi symplectic group point. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's, it's really just a the thing on the right is just a special case of of our group value mode map story. Okay, and so you get the correspondence between certain Hamiltonian Verrazzaro spaces and certain quasi-Hamiltonian PSL2R spaces. So I have to put in this certain, for one thing, you have to uh, kind of talk about finite dimensionality, so which spaces give something finite dimensional. That's, that's not so hard, but then the other thing is about these discrete stabilizers. So we get Hamiltonian Verrazzaro spaces, but they have certain stabilizers forced on them. So it's, it's not, Hamiltonian Verrazzaro spaces uh, with, with certain stabilizer properties. So there's unfortunately some technical issue there, but in, in one direction, uh, the, the correspondence is in any case very nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have that many examples yet, <laughs> but uh, I mean, for sure, when, when you have a quasi Hamiltonian PSO to R space, you can go uh, the other direction, and, and then you know this Hamiltonian Verrazzaro space that pops out of it, it ha has certain stabilizers. J just like the stabilizers that have been encountered for the coordinate orbits already. That's not how we formulated. I, I would rather say uh, you look at, no, no, the, the mode map is not proper. Even on the right hand side, it's not proper. Mm -hmm because our, our group is non-compact. Uh, rather, the way we formulate this is by, by looking at, um, at, at the orbits. The orbits should have co finite co-dimension. So if the orbits have finite co-dimension on one side, then they have finite co-dimension on the other side. So one, one might basically like, like slices, maybe not quite the right word, but one, one is transversals. And the transversals are in, in correspondence. So if I assume that on the left-hand side, we have uh, finite dimensional transversals, then on the right-hand side, we have finite dimensional transversals, and then on the right-hand side, we get something finite dimensional. 
because also the orbits are finite dimension. All right, so in particular, we get the correspondence between Cauchy-Jean Virasoro orbits and conjugacy classes, but now taking into account the Poisson structures, symplectic structures, and, and all that. Okay, coordinate expressions. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much you want to see of, the, of that. So uh, just, just like uh, uh, for, for this story of, of, of the, uh, the Virasoro Lie algebra itself, once you express everything in terms of coordinates, it actually becomes more complicated. It looks more impressive, but it it's just gets more complicated. Um, for starters, the space of developing maps in the case of a circle uh, is quasi periodic maps from R into RP1, right? That was the definition. And then we lift them to uh, maps into the universal cover of RP1, so this is function phi. Then, um, so P was this map to Hill operators that you can make explicit. In terms of this function phi, the way it looks like is um, okay, it's, it's second derivative the Laplacian plus the Hill potential, and the Hill potential is given by this formula with the phi's. So you see here again, there's a Schwarzian derivative in the picture, and then there's this uh, velocity squared. Yeah? I think I'll get back to the, that example in the end. Okay, so there's this, you have this uh, hill potential. It depends on, 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 on the quasi periodic map. So I can view this as a function on, on developing maps with values in quadratic differentials. Then we introduce another object, which is like, a, which plays kind of the role of a left invariant Mao Kata form, also described in terms of this phi. And then we have these, these two ingredients, this T and the theta, which is like a left Mao Kata form. And then we can explicitly write down what this two form on the space of developing maps is. So th this is kind of the simplest version that we could come up with. If you actually express it in terms of phi and its derivatives, it just gets horribly complicated. So the explicit formula probably doesn't really help. It's just, just to intimidate people. It's it very complicated. Yeah, so, so finally, I want to briefly get back to Hamiltonian Virasor spaces as examples. So, yeah, the, the main example that we're trying to understand is a surface uh, with at least one boundary component, maybe say for simplicity, one boundary component. And then you could look at um, this the representation uh, space for the group PSL2R. So that, that, as we know, is a quasi-Hamiltonian PSL2R space. And the MOM map you can lift to the universal cover. And then from that, you get examples of Hamiltonian Virasoro spaces. So you lift it to the universal cover, but then uh, remember we had, this, we had to deal with this certain uh, subset of the universal cover, this plus. So you just have to take the part of, of the space which lifts into the subset, which maps into the subset. So part of it we just have to throw away. But if, if we then apply the construction, we get examples of Hamiltonian Virasoro spaces. Yeah, and, and the claim fact is, so that, that's the thing we're we uh, working on right now, it is to explain that this space of conformally compact hyperbolic matrix on a surface up to diffeomorphisms fixing the boundary, that, 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 that will arise in this way. Um, maybe I'll try to explain this a little bit so, so we, we're going back to this picture from the physics papers, these surfaces with trumpet ends. Oh, this was not going to be. So, so we have here maybe some geodesic and then it goes like this. And so this is the kind of surface. Uh, still not very good picture. So this, this should kind of go off to infinity. It should be like, like a hyperbolic trumpet. And we're, so we're looking at conformally compact hyperbolic matrix. So as I said, conformally compact means um, 
uh, one way of saying it is it's a hyperbolic zero metric, a metric on the zero tangent bundle. But in more concrete terms, what it means is that near the boundary, uh, the metric uh, blows up like one over boundary function squared. One over boundary defining function squared. Um, well, one example of, of such a metric is the metric on the Poincare disk. Right? Uh, 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 Poincare disk, uh, sorry, uh, upper half plane of, of, of in here. Of course, you, you could also write for the Poincare disk. So that, that goes like one over boundary def, uh, defining function squared. So, so we're looking at, at functions which near the boundary have this uh, behavior, one over boundary function one over, over boundary defining function squared. And it turns out one can show, uh, I mean, we, we know any uh, uh, hyperbolic metric on a surface locally looks like the metric on the Poincare disk or on the upper half plane. You can always find coordinates like this. Uh, this fact extends to the case with boundary. So every uh, such conformally compact hyperbolic metric looks near the boundary exactly like, like this. And all right, so, so what I should explain uh, for one thing is uh, what is the moment map? Uh, if you have some uh, conformally compact hyperbolic metric on the surface, then we know near the boundary it looks like, like this. And the identification with the metric which exactly looks like this is unique up to the action of PSL to R, right? because that's the symmetry of, of this metric. So you're identifying uh, your boundary with this picture up to the action of PSL to R, which gives rise to a projective structure on the boundary. So whenever you have such a thing, you automatically get a projective structure on the boundary. And this map is basically the moment map. Because then it turns out, as I had briefly mentioned before, a projective boundary, a projective structure on the boundary is equivalent to a hill operator on the boundary. You could also say like, like this, on, on this, in this picture, there, there's a distinguished hill operator on the boundary, just this second derivative. And it's invariant under, second derivative, it's invariant, if I do it right, it's invariant under the action of PSL to R. And so you get a hill operator on the boundary, and that's the moment map. Um, the symplectic structure uh, seems to be more difficult to describe, and, and that's, that's basically what we were working on. Ideally, you would like to describe the symplectic structure directly in terms of the hyperbolic metric, but so far we don't really know how to do this. But then there's another description of the, hyper, uh, of, of the symplectic structure in terms of, um, yeah, again, connections, basically writing an ATIA bot formula. And this seems to, to work better. But it's still sort of under construction. And I believe that's, that's all.